Shalom Uvraha, peace and blessing. Welcome to Monday School. I invite you to turn with me to Mark, uh, Mark the 14th chapter, and we're going to be looking at verses 32 through 50. In these days, we're exploring the four days that changed the world, namely the four days between the Passover feast celebration, Jesus celebrating with his disciples what we now call the Last Supper through Resurrection Day. The, this is the four-day frame in which uh, we're, we're studying. And uh, after this lesson, there will be four more. So six lessons uh, regarding those four days. As we prepare, I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we submit ourselves to you uh, in thankfulness, first of all, for all that you have done for us, especially all that you have done for us in Christ Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with those who need a touch from above. Uh, specifically, we're thinking of David Doneski, uh, dealing with dizzy spells, and uh, his friend Jamie, who's awaiting a liver transplant. Uh, a young child, Knox Sampson, that we understand has just undergone surgery. And we ask not only that uh, you would bring healing to his body, but that you would give wisdom to those who are ministering to him medically. We ask that you would continue to be with Tina's brother, Randall. We thank you for all that you have done for him. Uh, and we ask as well that uh, you would be with Jeffrey and Anthony. And now, Father, as we study, enlighten our minds, warm our hearts, enable us to respond in ways that make a difference in our personal lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of those around about us. Uh, we want to be difference makers, O oh Lord, those who witness to the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Uh, anoint our pastor. Continue to use him to deliver your truth in a way that makes a difference in people's lives. Once again, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 14 starting with verse 32, and I'm going to read the entire passage through verse 50. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found again, again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scripture must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Going back to verse 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane. Notice it's not called the Garden of Gethsemane. It's Gethsemane, which means oil press. We're given to understand that Gethsemane was a place with a lot of olive trees. So it would, would be logical that when the olives were harvested, that the oil would be extracted uh, most conveniently in a place that was close by. And that is where they were in vicinity of the oil press. Now, John's Gospel refers to it as a garden. And that's where we get it, I'm putting these two ideas together. And that's, that's okay. Sit here, he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Now the standard praying stance of the Jews of that day was to stand. And uh, when, when he tells them to sit while he prays, the, the idea is, is almost as if they have been turned into spectators. Instead of pray with me, that sit means I want you close by, uh, but that he was not going to give a general call to prayer here that those who felt uh, moved to do so were certainly uh, invited and entitled. But his instruction was for them to sit, to park themselves, and wait. Ever been in the physician's waiting room and you wait and you wait and you feel like you're not doing any good but when it's over the one that you're waiting for comes and says thank you for staying with me <laughs> I wasn't with you I was out here and you were in there but somehow it makes a difference. So they sat while he prayed. Then he takes Peter and James and John, the inner three, 
and uh, that they are the ones who had seen him transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. They are the ones who had seen him raise Jairus's daughter. They had been eyewitnesses to that. And now he takes them uh, into confidence, as it were, that he brings them a little closer to ground zero for this moment. And uh, they, they come along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. And so here we have this wonderful picture. And when I say wonderful, not that it's delightful, but it is, uh, it gives us a glimpse of the Son of God who is fully God and fully man, and here is his humanity at its apex, that he is deeply troubled, and he even says so. My soul, that in the soul being the, the life, the expression of life of an individual, be still, O oh my soul, that's my mind, my will, my emotions, everything about me uh, that, that will live on when I no longer occupy this body. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He's basically saying, I feel like, I feel like I'm going to die. I uh, shared with the class that um, when I worked in a, a private school for a short while, and one of the things I was involved in was discipline of unruly children. We had one little five-year-old that was a real piece of work, and uh, we had to pull him off to one side. We tried not to do that very much, but we had to bring him to the to the principal's office. You know, that's if there's any place you don't want to go. He's five years old, and uh, he's sitting there, and the the lady who was the primary administrator of the school came in and she spoke to him and she said, how are you, Jason? And Jason said, I think I'm gonna die. So when you have a five-year-old who thinks he's gonna die, I mean, you understand he is in emotional, deep emotional distress. This is something worse than he's ever experienced. And when Jesus says he is, is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, that what do you think his sorrow is over? One, certainly that he came to that which was his own, as John said in his gospel and his own received him not, that he has been rejected. But also what he is about to face brings him great sorrow because he knows that his fellowship that has been unbroken with the Father from eternity past, that this fellowship will not just be put on pause, it will be shattered. It will be broken. 
And uh, so his sorrow is very real. And it's a sorrow that, uh, given enough time, could kill. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. And so he gives them a place that you can come this far and no far farther. But he says, stay here and keep watch. That they have been given the assignment to act as guards who have been posted. That they are to utilize their capacities, however limited they may be, to act as guards to watch. Going a little farther. So he's not way far off from them. He fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Staggered by the enormity of the load. I don't use that word very often. It gets misused. Something that's really, really, really big and people refer to its enormity. But if you look closely, uh, enormous covers that. But enormity is not only is it large and overwhelming, but there is a sense of, of, I don't know if evil is quite the right, but there is a tinge, at least a tinge of evil, a darkness that, that frightens us. Um, that's enormity. Um, that it's more than large in scope. It is, it is that which brings horror to those who experience it. So he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him the hour which hour what is the hour that is coming that you'll you'll recall not too long ago last week the Jews celebrated Purim which is the story of Esther and how the Jews were going to be exterminated because of the evil work of Haman in the background. And her uncle slash cousin, the text is unclear as to the exact relationship, but this man who has raised her because she's an orphan, that um, that she seems to be saying, what can I do about it? I'm just like you. Even though she has been brought into the palace and has been groomed possibly to become queen, and Mordecai says to her, who knows? but that you have been brought to your present position for this very hour. It is his hour. 
And that is the reason why what he says next is so important. Abba, Father. By the way, I've got to interrupt myself because I don't want to forget to say this, that Jesus never said, I think it's just an interesting side note, he never referred to God as our Father. And in so doing, he makes it clear that do we have the same Father? Yes, we do. And are we, his followers, his, his disciples, are we uh, to call him our Father? Yes, we are. But Jesus never uses the phrase personally. He speaks of my Father. And there is a relationship there that we cannot begin to comprehend. And when he says Abba, and that is the, the Hebrew version of, I don't like to, to translate it as daddy, but that's pretty close. Papa. Now, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. It's it's, yes, you're my father, but there is such an affection between us that father seems so distant by comparison. I'm, I'm the one who read in the crook of your arm. You're my papa. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. And dear friend, I want to remind you that in the midst of whatever circumstance you are facing or may face in the future, everything is possible. For our God. And the fact that everything is possible for him does not mean that it's going to come out exactly like you expect it to. But that's okay too. That we can't lose unless we walk away from him. We do not lose. Read the book. And don't be afraid to turn to the last pages because they tell you very clearly in the end. And between now and then, there are going to be some dark days, but in the end, we win. Why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. He says, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. This cup. What cup is he talking about? And there are several answers that people give, and they're probably all in some degree right, but it would appear to be, again, look at the book of Revelation and there's a cup there that is filled with the wrath of God. And it is that cup that Jesus faces. And he knows that the only way to get from where he is to where he needs to be is to drink the cup. Take this cup from me. And notice he doesn't say this lightly. He's not tippy-toeing around the issue. 
This is an imperative that what do I want? I want for you to take the cup, Father, that if there is any one in all creation who can figure out a way that I don't have to drink the cup, I know it's you. I entrust myself to you. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. And here is this total, this act of total love, devotion, and humility in which Jesus says, I know there's what I want, and I know there's what you want, and I'm willing to put what I want beneath what you want. Have your way, Lord. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. And Simon, he said to Peter, that's one of those reminders that sort of like a head slap. You remember that was your name three and a half years ago? Remember who you were? You remember what your, your life work was about at that point? Catching fish. Nothing wrong with that. But I told you that I would make you a fisher of men and that you would be called Peter Rocky. And what now? Are you asleep? This is Mr. Throughout three and a half years, Jesus had been walking down the road, and I think if there's any place that proves his divine nature was fully intact, as you, you get this picture as you read scripture that they're walking down the road and Jesus stops and Peter runs into him every time because he was walking that close. He was, he was not going to miss anything. And you just, you can imagine him stopping to look at the birds of the air or the flowers of the field. And when he stops, boom, there's Peter. Are you asleep? Mr. Into Everything, always at the front of the pack. Couldn't you keep watch for one hour, and again, that key word, hour, keep watch, and I don't think he's talking about 60 minutes here, I think he's talking about the sense of they've come to the time, the why, why this whole, this whole ministry has, has been moving from where it was to where it's going. We're coming to the hour. And you're part of it. Part of, of what you could have participated in, Peter, was to watch and pray. And you chose instead to sleep through it. Couldn't you keep watch one hour? 
watch and pray. So Jesus gives two instructions, both imperative, must do things, watch, be attentive, and pray. Call out to the Father. Why? Why do I need to be attentive and to be in connection with the Father? So that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus knows what's coming. Temptation in spades. Okay? So that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That this is, this is one of those I guess it's sort of an aphorism, uh, um, and it's become almost a proverb or an excuse. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I really want to do it, but sorry about that. Not up to it. So Jesus goes away and prays again when he came back found there were asleep again because their eyes were heavy. And I love this. They did not know what to say to him. They could only hang their heads. They had no excuse. All kinds of explanations for why. But it didn't really matter. That Jesus says, the hour, there it is again, the hour has come. This is what it's all about. We're getting right to the crux of the matter, and crux means cross. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners, the sinless one is delivered into the hands of sinners. They do not turn him over to somebody who is spotless, faultless, without accusation against them. Rise, he says, by the way, I skipped over a word, enough, enough. And when Jesus says the word enough, it's as if he said, I'm ready. Let's get this thing done. I am ready. Whatever doubts, whatever anguish, whatever pain he was experiencing above, that has been pushed to the edges. Enough. And it's time to move on. And we know the story of how Jesus, Judas betrayed him with a kiss. And, then, and Mark characteristically gives very little in the way of details. Even he, he feels compelled to tell how one of them, and he doesn't tell us who, John tells us it was Peter, but one of them drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear, and gives us no more details. Nothing. We, it's somebody else has got to fill in the gaps to tell us how Jesus healed that ear. And then Jesus basically asks them about their indictment that you come and arrest me in the dark of night when I have been where you could grab a hold of me any time you wanted to, right there in the temple courts, and nobody said a word. 
but the scripture must be fulfilled. And verse 50 tells us, then everyone deserted him and fled. Was it a lonely place? You better believe it. But was he alone? Not for a microsecond. Jesus and his father on their way to Calvary. Father in heaven, use this this word and these truths to remind us, to humble us, to, to bring us to prayer and seeking the Father's face as we prepare for the hour that changed the world forever. Thank you for changing us. Thank you for all that you've done for us in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name, amen.